Coming up on We Talk News this week, cannabis licenses are back in New York. Get in line, starting now and ending in the first week of December. CEO Adam Levin of High Times is in more hot water, this time with the SEC over fraud allegations. MPP and Normal, two major lobbying groups for cannabis reform at the state and federal level, are thinking about merging, another sign of a market correction in the industry. And cannabis nursing is now recognized by the American Nurses Association as a certified specialty field. While the U.S. Department of Agriculture approves a variety of hemp with a lower level THC component, all but eliminating hot hemp. And we introduce you to a new Michigan correspondent, Amy Carter, who's fighting for her autistic son's right and access to his medicine at school. All that and more on We Talk News next. We're the governor. We are pro cannabis media. Hi everyone, welcome to We Talk News, Pro Cannabis Media's weekly roundup of news stories from coast to coast and around the world. I'm PCM founder Jimmy Young, filling in for Elena Pinto, who is off this week, but will be back next week. Our top story comes from New York. That's where their governor, Kathy Hochul, has opened up the process for cannabis licensure in her state that had been shut down by legal challenges. Now, for all things related to cannabis reform in the Empire State, we turn to Pam Schmiel. Pam? Thanks, Jimmy. Hey, Pam, thank you so much for joining us early this morning. Huh? You know, it was a big day in New York yesterday with the opening of licensure for everybody, including the multi-state operators, 1,500 total licenses up for grabs now in New York until December 8th, when that window of application will close. What was the reaction you got from the people that you were at, at Gary George's Real Cannabis Entrepreneur and others in, in the city? Well, everyone that I'm talking to, you know, from farmers to brands to the card app, you know, card uh, social equity uh, entrepreneurs, I feel like everyone is so ready to get the industry going because so many people are suffering. Um, you know, I think the the Office of Cannabis Management had good intentions, uh, you know, rolling out this social equity program, but it has backfired and they need to move on. And I think everyone realizes that. And I think there's also the sentiment is that it's it's caused a lot of uh, segregation that we don't want. And, um, you know, almost to the point where people are even saying, can we not say the words social equity anymore? Like, let's just all be together, work together and go forward. And, and you know, it's, it's a dire situation. I, if, you know, you saw in the news at a recent meeting uh, with the OCM, a farmer showed up with a noose around her neck. I mean, people are really seriously talking about suicide. And the Office of Cannabis Management, it was such a raucous meeting, they didn't, uh, they didn't publicly, uh, you know, they, they hid the video of, of what the reactions at, at the meeting. Um, so I think everybody really is happy because we need the economy moving, the supply chain moving. Um, and uh, yeah, we're in a lot of trouble. So um, I think everybody's pretty happy about it. Yeah, it's a market correction. It, 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 well, yes, yes, everybody's in trouble, but it's going through a market correction of a new industry. And one of the factors in the decision yesterday was to allow the multi-state operators to come into New York to kind of solidify the market and, and give it the kind of support that it needs so that the craft growers can grow and and also compete with the MSOs. So bringing in the MSOs, they're not evil. They, they're they a necessary part of a new industry. Do you agree with that? Yes, um, of course, there's a lot of talk about that, fear the MSOs coming in. But honestly, I feel like the people I've been talking to lately are kind of softening to the idea of, listen, they're here to stay. We have to work with them. Let's let's try to figure out how we can all work together. And I even spoke to someone yesterday at Gary George's uh, conference, um, someone who's trying to actually create partnerships between the MSOs and say the brands or you know legacy people to help them, you know learn, you know do what they don't know as far as you know launching a brand. So 
I, I feel it's it's very important for all of us to work together because no one's going away. Well, I don't know about you, but I know that this plant has bonded people in the past. Okay. And I'm talking about when you're committing an act of civil disobedience back in the day when it was illegal and you'd go around the corner and you'd hang out with black people or Puerto Rican people or Native American people and you'd pass a joint because it was the thing to do and you all were sharing a moment together. And that's what this plant as everybody knows, part of why it's been put on this earth is to bring people together. Uh, well, Pam, I really appreciate you taking some time out this morning. I know you're going to go back to Gary George's Real Cannabis Entrepreneur, and thank you so much for sending us some video for that. And as always, we'll always look forward to your reports on We Talk News in the future. Unfortunately, the one thing that New York is already challenging California for is the crackdown on illicit, unlicensed operators. To date, New York has seized over 8,500 pounds of weed with a value of over $42 million. <laughs> right now, that's pocket change for California, where a series of busts has shut down a number of illicit operators, and one bust in an Oakland warehouse was for 1,800 pounds and upwards of $37 million in value. These busts have kind of put a damper on the harvest in October. Our California reporter, is Lavana Vassa. I'm Lavana Vassa from the Bay Sesh, reporting for PCM with this week's California report for Wheat Talk News. It's Croptober in California, the biggest crops of the year starting to get chopped from full sun to indoor. The biggest harvest time of the year is here. In California, this always comes with its ups and downs. Croptober harvest is a time when the growers must be on high alert for rippers or thieves, and if they happen to be unlicensed grows, enforcement. Last month in Oakland, after a long investigation, two warehouses in the 300 block of Adeline Street were raided by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who are part of the Governor's Unified Cannabis Enforcement Task Force, UCETF. Several news sources reported that they eradicated over 41,000 plants and destroyed over 1.8 thousand pounds, claiming a retail value of almost $37 million. There were other busts up in Tulo Tuolumne County. Detectives from the DCC enforcement seized 3.7 million in plants and flowers from several people. An Oakley PD in the DCC raided five illegal grow houses in the East Bay last month, seizing more than 4.2 thousand plants. On October 5th, the DCC announced in a press release that since its inception in 2022, the governor's UCETF has seized over $295 million in unlicensed cannabis, eradicated over 277,000 plants, and seized 101 firearms. While enforcement's been ramping up, the legal market is still maturing in its fifth year. And something we can look forward to in Croptober is seeing what cultivars the growers are most proud of and which ones are catching a buzz amongst connoisseurs. Tune in for my story next week to find out which harvests are reaping the most love from growers and consumers alike in the epicenter of cannabis culture, Northern California. That's this week's California Cannabis Report. I'm Lavana Vassa from PCM reporting for We Talk News. Next up, what is going on in Florida? The group behind the ballot initiative for adult use sale in Florida is the Smart and Safe Campaign. It is being funded by the largest MSO in that state, TrueLeave. Now, that group has already collected over 1 million signatures and has over 800,000 medical patients using this medicine. Now, the Florida Attorney General, Ashley Moody, is going to fight to remove that ballot question altogether. We all know how their governor, Ron DeSantis, feels about this issue. And when the AG gets to the state Supreme Court to plead her case, the judges there are expected to agree with her. The Tallahassee Democrat News Service reminds us all that the Supreme Court of Florida has already rejected five of the last nine voter initiatives. That hearing is on November 8th. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., the two largest cannabis lobbying groups, Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, and the MPP, the Marijuana Policy Project, are reportedly in talks about merging since their funding has been impacted by the industry market correction that is going on right now. Our D.C. reporter is Andrew Berenger, and he has more. Reporting from Washington, D.C., this is Andrew Berenger for We Talk News. You may be wondering who are Normal and Marijuana Sea Policy Project, and why does their potential merger matter for cannabis policy? 
Well, Normal and MPP are two of the biggest groups lobbying lawmakers at both the federal and state level to advance cannabis reform. Their collaborative efforts have helped multiple states roll out new cannabis programs and industries. For example, during the midterm elections of last year, five states had cannabis legalization on the ballot for voters to decide on. Of those five states, Missouri and Maryland voted yes, clearing the way for new commercial cannabis markets in those states. Normal and MPP both worked closely with these states to get those measures approved and help shape the laws. In just the first three months of sales, Missouri generated over $250 million in sales, while Maryland raked in over $268 million in sales. Though keep in mind, not all states with new programs are seeing this level of success yet. As the cannabis industry grows, other big corporate interests are also spending heavily to influence policy. Over $140 million was spent on lobbying efforts alone for one specific industry, <coughs> alcohol industry. That's why it's so important that advocacy groups like Normal and MPP join forces at this critical time. Together, they can better push for the regulatory changes needed at both state and federal levels. Now, in other federal news, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy made history this week as the first ever speaker removed by a House floor vote. Surprisingly, the push for his removal came from members of his own Republican Party. How will this dramatic shakeup impact prospects for passing cannabis reform? Tune in next week as we analyze whether a divided GOP could stall or spur progress on cannabis legislation. Well, that will do it for me in the D.C. Area Report for this week. Once again, I am Andrew Berenger, reporting for We Talk News. We are so happy to introduce you to someone who I think is going to be a very much a appreciated contributor to our program weekly. Her name is Amy Carter. She's from Michigan. And if anybody has been following Pro Cannabis Media's posts over the last week or so, we've lost a dear, dear friend, Rick Thompson. Uh, he had been my Michigan correspondent for three years. Okay, and he passed away September 18th for, after his battle with cancer. And reading an article about Amy yesterday, I saw she was from Michigan. I figured she actually might know Rick Thompson. And what do you think? Of course she does. She's joining us now. Amy, uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. And and also, uh, tell us a little bit about your... Um, you actually knew Rick Thompson in 3D. I did not. I only knew him through Zoom, and I still loved him. So um, tell me what the loss of Rick is going to mean to the Michigan cannabis community. Uh the loss of Rick is is huge. Uh, he was very, very talented in what he did. He connected a lot of people and looking back and, you know, listening to people's stories, uh, we realized how important, you know, he really is. I mean, don't get me wrong. We knew he was important when he was here. Um, but seeing the connections that he made and uh, just where he he got the cannabis community here in Michigan. I mean, he was a fierce advocate. He didn't hold back. He was great with his words. Uh, just, he was remarkable. And he's definitely gonna be missed by by all of us. Well, I really hope that you and I will continue to talk about how we might be able to maybe create something in his name in Michigan. And I have no idea how that can happen, but uh, it is part of my uh, mantra to keep turning uh, positive negatives into positives. And uh, that's really this story here. Amy, your story is pretty compelling too, as I read up on it, as a, a mother who's fighting for the rights of her autistic child to actually have access to medical marijuana in the school. Can you tell us a little bit how it all happened with your child, Jaden? Uh, yes, um, I started medicating my son, Jaden, uh, when he was just nine years old. Uh, it That kind of gets into a long story, so I won't get into all of that. Uh, but he was not able to uh, take his medicine, obviously, to school. And so I would get phone calls uh, from the school, you know, can you bring a special medicine up? And it's, you know, that was four years ago. Uh, he's now 16 years old, and we've been working on this bill 
since 2018. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, Illinois with Ashley's Law. Uh, they're the mother of Ashley serves on the committee for Jaden's Law. Got it. And uh, I actually think I've met Ashley um, before, believe it or not. But, it, you know, it's a small cannabis world. That's what I tell people anyway. Um, like so many uh, compelling stories about this plant, this was a last resort for you because you had tried a lot of different things. Am I right? Yes, it was a last resort. I actually had CPS that was getting ready to force me to terminate my rights because my son was so violent and aggressive. And so at that point I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to try this. So I got him his card for nausea and migraines and it calmed his aggressive behaviors. It improved his quality of life. His IQ went up, his cognitive impairment diminished. I mean, it's been nothing but good things but a lot of bad stigma still surrounds it. Absolutely, and that's what we fight for. We want to give the stories to people like you who are fighting for the rights of their children and also the rights to accept this plant as a medicine and treat it that way. My One of my biggest beefs, and of course we just met this week, is the fact the word recreational. I don't believe that any medicine should be used recreationally, even though we know that a, you, there are quite a few that do. I always use the Robitussin example because Robitussin is now an over 21 product that you have to show an ID before you walk out of the drugstore. And, and we all accept that because after all, Robitussin wasn't vilified for 85 years like the cannabis plant has been. And I, I just wonder, again, as someone who has seen these results, it this plant is a powerful help that can change people's lives. And in this case, it changed your child's life and your life too. Yes, a hundred percent. And, you know, being an autism mom and trying to, you know, navigate on gluten-free diets and coping skills and medicines and all that, um, cannabis has been the best tool that mm -hmm. has allowed him to use the other tools in his toolbox uh, because he he didn't really have the ability to process his thoughts and to be able to slow down enough to be able to utilize the the therapies that he had been taught. And so it really opened up a lot of doors. It is a great, great tool um, medication for him. And, and now you'll be able to report on what's going on in your state of Michigan uh, moving forward and also your battle uh, to get Jaden the right to take his medicine at school. So we welcome you to the We Talk News family and pro cannabis media. And we will have more of the We Talk News show after this. As for the publicly traded cannabis stocks, Tilray had a good quarter of revenue exceeding projections, but how did that affect their stock? Well. Here's Doug Miller with this week's High on Wall Street report. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's cannabis stock report for Weed Talk News. That's right. Tilray did post a net revenue of $177 million, an increase of 15% year over year for its first quarter earnings report. Its cannabis division brought in $70 million. And I think Tilray is playing it smart by investing in the beverage industry. Who knows when cannabis will be federally legal in the U.S.? And now they have something else big to keep the company going. Now let's look at the stock chart. It's been trading around 212, and it has been dipping the last few days. And it looks like it wants to continue to dip, but I'm watching for that bottom because it's going to bounce hard. And that's this week's Cannabis Stock Report reporting for Weed Talk News. I'm Doug Miller. A study in Canada of 60,000 participants has concluded that those with the so-called cannabis use disorder have a 60% increase of having a cardiovascular event. Now, the study admits that the difference of 2.4% chance versus 1.5% chance is only 540 people out of that study of 60,000, but you will see headlines about a 60% increase if you have cannabis use disorder. Everyone can find a study now that supports both sides of this issue. Oh, Canada. That's where Debbie Facey reports from every week. 
This is Debbie, your Canadian correspondent with Me Talk News with your Canadian Joint of the Week. What we have in Canada this week is Health Canada actually going in depth with some of the medical patients here in Canada and especially when it comes to their growers license and whether or not they are actually abiding by the rules which is which is which is based on which is allotted to them based on their prescription. We also have our two recalls. One is from the cannabis company Culshin Cannabis which has their Lemon Z drops which have been recalled due to a mold contamination which I have to say is, I don't want to say gross but pretty gross. And those are all going to be recalled and have been recalled and have been notified to all of the stores out. What we also have is the Dibby vape pen, which has been inaccurately labeled with double the amount of CBD, which is actually not in the vape pen. As we do know that when it comes to labeling and when it comes to most of anything that has to do with the FDA, it does have to be across the board approved and it also has to entail and have exactly what is inside of the product that is being sold. This is Debbie, your Canadian correspondent with We Talk News with your Canadian Joint of the Week. Peace. High Times might be the oldest and most recognizable brand in the cannabis industry, but they are constantly in the news for all the wrong reasons. Adam Levin, their CEO, is now under investigation by the SEC for fraud. High Times went public back in March of 2018 and shares were sold at $11. Now the SEC is claiming that there is an alleged malpractice of the use of those funds with investors. The SEC is going to look for a civil penalty and prohibit Levin for ever being involved in any securities in the future. Is anyone in this industry paying their bills on time? Some reports from wholesalers and ancillary companies claim it can take as much as 120 days to get paid. It's happening in Oregon. That's where Marianne Kersagy has this report. I'm Marianne from Alibi with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. The cannabis industry in Oregon continues to be plagued with late payments. The state intervened a few months ago and more details are coming to light. Permanent rules are now in rulemaking to replace the temporary rules enacted earlier this year. In spite of talks to expand this to all license types, it now appears to be applicable only to retail licensees who are delinquent on any taxes collected by the Oregon Department of Revenue. Retailers will now need to obtain a certificate of tax compliance in order to renew their cannabis license. Also, Oregon's aspergillus testing rules continue to get media coverage. This week, MJ Biz Daily reported on the issue. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, aspergillus mold is not harmful to healthy people. The Oregon Health Authority has not reported any cases of aspergillosis connected to cannabis use. Why then is there a big push to test for aspergillus? And finally, Croptober is starting. The annual fall harvest is beginning, and we celebrate the work and dedication of all sun-grown farmers. That'll do it for the Oregon Report this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi. Gary George's real cannabis entrepreneur extravaganza is going on in Newark, New Jersey this week. Our New York reporter, Pam Schmiel, was there today and was actually able to get some video from their Spark Tank panel. Look, there's old friend David Feldman from Skip Intro Advisors, Dr. David Kunick of UCS Advisors, and Ben Richardson from 730 Capital. That's quite a lineup. Dab Riga was pitching them today about his new manufacturing business. The Real Cannabis Entrepreneur Show is just one of the happenings in New Jersey this week. Jill Goldsbury has more, including a break for a New Jersey policeman who used cannabis in his off-duty hours and then was fired for doing it. Hello, everyone. Jill Goldsbury here with reporting for We Talk News New Jersey, and there's lots happening this week, so let's get into it. First, cannabis and the police. A state grand jury has declined to charge a Jersey City police officer who has been embroiled in litigation over cannabis use in his um, off-duty time. Uh, in the fatal shooting of a suspect last year. The decision marks the end of an investigation into Officer Omar Palenko concerning a May 24th shooting resulting in the death of Joseph Roberson, 59, a, of Jersey City. 
Last month, the Civil Service Commission ruled that Officer Polanco was wrongly terminated by the Jersey City Police Department, and they have ordered for the immediate reinstatement and back pay and attorney's fees. Uh, This decision allowed for three other findings that the JCPD policy has run amok on in the state law. So um, the investigation into Roberson's death carried out by the Office of Public Integrity and Accountability found that Polanco shot Roberson after Roberson was armed with a firearm and put a woman in a headlock. So essentially, the shooting was a good shooting, according to the Office of Integrity and Accountability. In other news, the Real Cannabis Entrepreneurs Conference is hitting this week in Newark. It's landed and it's here at the Doubletree Hilton Hotel, Newark Airport, October 5th and 6th. The conference is the first of its kind. The Real Cannabis Conference is the only event focused on providing progressive business owners, investors, and opportunity seekers with real life know-how and information on breaking into the industry uh, with with a fantastic list of speakers from all walks of the business. Definitely something to check out if you're interested in really delving into the business further. Also coming up, October 12th, New Jersey Insiders Cannabis Business Conference is back at the same hotel, the Doubletree Hilton Hotel, Newark. Attendees have the opportunity to network, attend breakout sessions, and this year's keynote address will be delivered by none other than Wanda James of Simply Pure. So head over to New Jersey Insiders for tickets. I'm Jill Goldsberry with We Talk News, and that's what's happening this week. Thanks for watching. Speaking of Skip Intro Advisors, that's where Angie Seifert works, and she has our Connecticut Cannabis Report for this week on We Talk News. I'm Angie Seifert from Skip Intro Advisors with the Connecticut Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Is Connecticut's cannabis market growing too quickly? In the nearly nine months since adult use sales began in Connecticut, the market has grown quickly, already surpassing the number of dispensaries per person that the neighboring Massachusetts state had within its first year. And by this time next year, there will be 69 dispensaries in the state. Now, looking at statistics, adult use is likely pulling some consumers from the legacy market. Connecticut's adult use retail sales in January closed at 5.1 million with over 114,000 products sold. And in August, roughly 355,000 adult use products turned a much higher profit of 14 million. Yet, it is difficult to quantify if Connecticut's retail gains come from brand new cannabis users or consumers turning to the legal market instead of the illegal one. Next, the safe use of cannabis was the top issue discussed at the Community Cannabis Forum held at the City Hall in Norwalk, Connecticut, where residents put their concerns to a panel of experts as the city's first legal cannabis dispensary prepares to open later this year. One panelist, the prevention director at Positive Directions and the co-chair of the Norwalk Partnership, focused on drug prevention among young people who pointed out that many people are misinformed about the danger of cannabis, yet others discussed that in states where cannabis is commercialized, teen addiction has increased by 25%. We'll see what happens, right? Finally, Wilton seeks public input on whether to ban or allow cannabis sales in town. The town's moratorium on cannabis retailers and growers is set to expire on October 29th, and officials must decide what to do next. Permanently prohibit it from Wilton, extend it another year, or allow it. Neighboring municipalities, including New Canaan, Weston, and Newtown, have rules in place prohibiting cannabis sales in town. Ridgefield residents voted at a special town meeting to ban cannabis establishment. Currently, Westport allows cannabis sales only for medical use. I'm Angie Seifert from Skip Intro Advisors with the Connecticut Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. We haven't heard from Washington State in a few weeks, but Matthew Friedlander is back with us this week And here's his report from the Great Northwest. 
Hello, everyone. Matthew Friedlander coming to you from the owner's office here at Skagit Organics with the Washington State Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. I have been MIA the last couple of weeks. My apologies for that, but here I am. Uh, so we are already gearing up for our legislative session, which starts uh, at the beginning of January. This is going to be a short session lasting only 60 days. So there is a lot of work to be done in not a lot of time. Uh, one thing that we are hopeful on this year, uh, there seems to be support from the LCB for the removal of the excise tax from medical cannabis products for medical cannabis patients. Fantastic news. We are real hopeful that we can get this passed with the support of the our regulatory agency. Um, there seems to be some appetite as well in the legislature this year for getting home grow passed. It's been five or six years now we've been trying to do that. So we are hopeful that this will be the year. Uh, the other big pressing issue for cannabis companies here in Washington are the continued amount of uh, the store robberies that continue to happen. Uh, so the Cannabis Alliance is working with the governor's office to provide some information on that issue, uh, trying to figure out how we can help and uh, how much money is needed to help the retail stores here in Washington fortify their stores against these continued robberies. Uh, so it's nice to see some support from the higher ups here in Washington and hopefully some money being set aside uh, to help our local stores. That's what I got for you. Uh, Matthew Friedlander reporting for We Talk News. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And finally tonight, a little different Bay State Cannabis Report. There are two major stories in Massachusetts, both involve the Cannabis Control Commission. One is a huge wrongful death fine handed down by the CCC to Trulieve for the death of one of their workers earlier this year, a story that Mike Crawford has done a great job on. And the other is a lawsuit brought by the chair of the commission, Shannon O'Brien, against her boss, state treasurer, Deborah Goldberg. Talking Joints memo reporter Chris Ferrone joins me to give his unique view of what is going on. For now, though, I'm PCM founder Jimmy Young. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. And here is the Ferrone and Young Show. The Massachusetts Cannabis Report on Weed Talk News is sponsored by CNA Stores, with two locations of their veteran-owned and family-operated dispensaries in Amesbury and Haverhill, dedicated to the community north of Boston, providing consumers with the widest selection of products in the state. This is the Bay State Cannabis Report, brought to you by CNA Stores of Amesbury and Haverhill. Joining us now for the Bay State Report is the man, the myth, the this guy who puts the Talking Joints memo together every week, his name is Chris, Chris Ferrone. Chris, thank you so much for joining us here today. Always a pleasure, Jimmy. How's it going, man? It's going okay, but it's not going so well for the Cannabis Control Commission, unless you are looking for good copy. Um, we'll get to the lawsuit between <laughs> Goldberg and Shannon O'Brien in a minute. Let's talk about the fine that the Cannabis Control Commission finally instilled on TrueLeave, even though they're not in the, the state anymore, but that is because of that wrongful death of an employee uh, earlier in the year. What else is going on with that? You said you might might have to be able to advance that story a little bit. Well, I mean, oh no, no, there are there are people who are way ahead of me on that story. I got to give props to Mike Crawford for one who really broke the truly story in the first place. But what I want it not advance as much as my big comment on that story is something, and I don't want to get too inside media for the general viewer but it's important for everyone to realize that you know the news of this ma massive fine against a ma you know a major player one of the biggest companies in the country uh m biggest mso's that was basically run out of massachusetts with little accountability up to this juncture we found out about it in the in a globe editorial now this isn't me just being jealous as a reporter and i mean that it, it, it brings up the question of they didn't the, the Cannabis Control Commission, for reasons beyond my understanding, I'm working on figuring it out, didn't release the information. They didn't press release out it, about it. And you would think, considering all the things we're about to talk about, the shit storm, OK, that that's going on with them right now, the hell storm. You would think that, you know, the news that they really find this you know, apparently nefarious player. But I will say this about truly you're going to see now that that is out and now that they are gone from the state uh, and there's more information coming out about their testing practices, the facility itself, it's just going to keep on coming out. So 
definitely watch Talking Joints Memo, but also, you know, all the other reporters have covered it for, you know, for several years. Um, but really, it's it's kind of it boggles the mind, but it's huge news. Obviously, other operators are taking note. But I will say that, you know, from this stuff I'm seeing, in my opinion, they're just they were so egregious. You know, you really you're really glad that they're not in Massachusetts, frankly. And when your friends in Florida and other places in a couple of years are telling you, like, this legal weed stuff is terrible. Explain to them, you know, what that what why that happened, what the hell happened and how, you know, Massachusetts will still have a craft market at that point, And a lot of other states will have True Leaf. Yeah. And True Leaf is backing the adult use initiative in the state of Florida, too, because after all, um, what do they have? 30 dispensaries in that state. They're definitely the most dominant one down there. Right. I got to say, I looked at the let. I, I looked at the, the legislation that truly even other made uh, some other MSOs are backing down there because I honestly didn't even believe, uh, you know, I got to check it out. If your mother tells you she she loves you. Check it out. Right. Um, that That's what we used to say in the newsroom, of course. And in this case, you know, I'm hearing from activists, well-respected ones, not like I didn't believe them. But when they were saying the uh, talk, telling me about the assault on home grow. Uh, it was just almost unbelievable. You think of it, you know, it's it's literally the sunshine state, literally. Okay. Uh, you know, this stuff and, and it's, you know, there are di different land race, you know, strains that have to be grown down there. And that's that's beyond my expertise. What I do know is politics. And it is unbelievable. And anybody who knows Florida knows that it's very hard to lobby on Tallahassee. It's like a, you know, eight hour drive from South Florida, you know, from from normal Florida where, you know, people aren't incestuous and whatnot. And you know, so it's just it's just unbelievable. The populated area. I don't know about the other one. All right. Now, let's get to the uh, patent place of cannabis in, in Massachusetts. The the lawsuit between Shannon O'Brien and Deborah Goldberg. Who's in charge? Deborah Goldberg suspended Shannon O'Brien. And now we're going to find out why. Yeah. So, you know, I just want a little little uh, interesting, funny quip is right after when the you know, so obviously the background for anyone who's just dropping in from another state is that uh, for some odd reason, I guess, you know, all states operate like this. Our Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission really has two layers of people right there. There are the appointed. Those are the commissioners. Yep. Uh, and, and then there are the, you know, the executive director, the attorneys, the the hires. OK, mm -hmm. and and I'll get to the specifics in a second. But what we have here is a giant power struggle. Mm -hmm. Now, Deb Goldberg, the treasurer, is like a third party in this power struggle because she's the, uh, gets to appoint the chair of the Cannabis Control Commission, who is currently Shannon O'Brien. Now, the quip I was going to tell you is that when this news first broke that the chair was suspended by the treasurer. Uh, with no reason given midway through September, I believe it was the 14th, although like everything else, we never know when things actually happen, just when they hit the news, right? Um, we looked up, you know, you just look up everything. So when you're a reporter, one of the places you go is the Office of Campaign Finance to see who's given money to who. And uh, one of our other reporters, Dan Atkinson, who I work with, he said, uh, <laughs> he goes, oh, looks like... Uh, Looks like Shannon O'Brien gave Deb Goldberg two hundred and fifty dollars in the last election cycle. I said that. And he goes, I bet she's going to want that back. <laughs> so what you have now is, you know, the way it was done. Uh, and I'll just even back up a second. I'll be the first to say that, you know, I, I try to play it straight, actually, as a cannabis reporter, even though I've always really I don't really believe in, you know, objective reporting. I'm the subjective alternative news guy. But when it comes to this. I don't mean objective as much as, you know, listen, there's just a lot of people saying different things. And if you, anybody who's watched the meetings knows that, listen, Chair O'Brien didn't always have it together. She's very, obviously a very smart person. She'd been in government and doing big things for years. She was, you know, uh, uh, which, uh, why am I blanking on this? Did she run for, she she ran, was lieutenant ran for governor? governor? She ran for governor. governor and, you know, so I, I think that what I mean, though, is this is just like, why is she there? She doesn't really understand cannabis. Everything is like learning from day one when there's a million people who know this stuff, including some of the other commissioners. Anyway, what we've seen in the past in the two past two weeks, though, is even though anyone who watched from the outside looked like, yeah, O'Brien was, you know, re openly hostile, frankly, to some of the other commissioners and people who work there. Now we're seeing some of the reasons come out. And the way we've seen that is when the suspension happened. There was really no information. That was the biggest criticism. Even people who didn't like Chair O'Brien were like, "Okay, well, why?" Right. And it was it was kind of it was ridiculous too because they were like, "We're taking your laptop." It's like this isn't like an international spy mission. It looked you know it looked so silly. And then 
Uh, and then what happened was basically it took some time. And I think it was uh, some some good reporting. Katie Lannon, I think, over at GBH did mm-hmm. some great reporting and got the treasurer to talk. I could be messing up the order of operations, but slowly over the past two weeks, oh, the treasurer's come out with some reasons saying basically there were complaints about O'Brien's behavior. And O'Brien has come out with a lawsuit. So that that broke last week. That was the big news at the end of last week or mid last week, and it is a doozy. There, you know, it's it, there's just all this stuff in there about how she was just to- totally iced out from day one, and it really, I gotta say, I, I mean, who knows? It, let the courts decide what really happens, or but it's it it really does present another side of the coin, where uh, you know, it, whereas it really seemed, and then on top of that, I'll just uh, I'll say we published today a talking joints memo or yesterday. Jeff Rawson from the Institute of Cannabis Science in Cambridge. I know Jeff. Put out a letter of his own. And, the, you know, Jeff Rawson is at the center of a lot of, you know, really a, a lot of noise being made that uh, on the lab testing front right. about the CCC really not playing an active role or a role at all in in those safety issues around lab testing and potency. It's not just safety. It's also a, a, a consumer issue. And what 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 he's saying, what Rawson's saying, and, and, and a, a, along with other people, is that O'Brien was the only person listening to him. Hmm. So you know, you know, so this is all kind of like I don't know if it's for better or worse, or who the hell knows. But this is, it, it, is scandal the right word? I wouldn't say scandal. I don't think anyone's in Miami Beach, but it is really just. I guess it's kind of unfortunate. And before I shut up, I just want to say one thing. I got to give them a little credit because through all of this. Really, the Cannabis Control Commission, the commission, they did get a lot done. I mean, they rewrote um, the host host community agreement stuff. So uh, all these stipulations really going to stop a lot of abuse by municipalities that are saying, you know, you want to set up a dispensary here. Give us this. Donate to my cousin's nonprofit. That can't happen anymore. Well, that, so I'm they got that balanced, done. I'm glad you balanced that. But I'm going to ask you one last question. OK, mm-hmm. how embarrassing is this to the industry? Uh, I, I hate to be defensive. Like, I don't really, that's not my nature. I'm not into sports. I don't like go, go this team, go team. I do have a, but you know, having covered them up close is two things I want to say in their defense before I smash them. Uh, there's never been, including the gaming commission, yep. which Bruce which commissioner Stebbins was on. And especially the alcohol beverage control commission. There's never been like a millionth of this much scrutiny mm-hmm. on any of them. You know, if we went around as, you know, sometimes the, the Herald especially used to do this and jump all over someone. But if, you know, go to any governor's council meetings, you see a bunch of adults screaming at each other. This stuff happens in government. So that that kind of layer, I'm not saying it's always the case and it always kind of stinks. You know, then then the other thing is this is just like a massive thing that they're doing. There's all these new play, stores coming on. Now, I do not condone a lot of the alleged behavior. Uh, and I think this is, it's just, it's, you know, it spells bureaucracy. If money had to be made, it's like you always say, and I'm barely a capitalist saying this, you know, so when I say it, I mean it, if there's, if money had to be made, they, they'd be getting along a little bit better, but as it goes, it's more of a high school lunchroom situation. Um, but you know, as for, as for defending masks against other States, I got to say, listen, California screwed oh. this up first, you know, right. Oregon, all these States, Oklahoma, the medical is so out of control that the, the people voted against uh against adult use you got you know maine which i love it's a free-for-all but it's a free-for-all you know you're a caregiver and now you're how you're selling whatever I and mean, that's i'm fine with that i'm not passing judgment and new york where you know judges keep stopping the whole program i don't know how they're ever going to really get out of the starting gate and you know god knows how many lawsuits they're going to have stacked up i'd say against all that massachusetts has done okay i mean this is totally embarrassing although they haven't really been smashed nationally as much as you would think they would they would have been for it well, because I don't think anybody nationally cares. It's it's just it looks bad. It looks like two people who don't get along. They didn't communicate. One suspended one. Anyway, I don't want to get into the details because I don't know. All I know is anything like this, I think, reflects poorly on the industry. I think it also exposes the fact that our governors, our governments, whether they be town, state, or federal, are doing everything they possibly can to make it as difficult as possible to be in the cannabis industry. That's what I think. Yeah. And I'll also, I I think that also a lot of, um, it just doesn't, it doesn't play out for, you know, anybody who was skeptical in the first place. And it's kind of like I remember, you know, I covered gay marriage and as soon as there were like divorces started a couple of years later, as if there, as if, right, you know, 
other marriages don't have high divorce rates, but everyone was quick to point. Look, they're getting divorced. Why would everybody want to get married? This is what we have with cannabis for, you know, there could be a hundred uh, successes in one day. If there's one massive failure, a place gets broken into. It's basically, I told you so. It's so, you know, I think you really have to navigate right. through that. At the same time, I will say there's a lot of licensees who are, are really, you know, it, beside themselves. Now, whether the licenses would be flowing faster if they had their stuff together at the CCC more so, I don't know. But I do know that for all those people who are waiting and that extra week cost you 50 grand because you got payroll at this point or whatever it is. I do know for that crowd, many of whom get aggravated with me, and I understand it for kind of just reporting it straight up, like, "Hey, this is what happens," or even kind of poking fun at. Look, look at this little kind of you know this argument, this petty squabble. I mean, they're so passive aggressive to each other sometimes. It's it's mind boggling. It's like watching uh, it, it, you know, the the uh, the Saturday Night Live Andy Rooney spoof. Frankly, you know, it, it's it's. You think so you I don't know. It, it, Andy Rooney? Come on, I remember him. I'm old enough. I don't think a lot of the well, consumers of cannabis know who Andy. As long as his daughter, as long as his daughter still burning, burning up hell on uh, around here. It, she's Emily Rooney does not like uh, yours truly. So we, well, she's one of my she's, she's one of my favorite nemeses from over the years. Obviously, much more accomplished. She, I mean, she was doing. She was uh, one of you know, really strong early woman journalist when you were doing your thing in TV, right? Yes, she was. I, yeah. I never worked for her, but I certainly knew of her. Um, but anyway, Chris, as usual, entertaining, informative, keep up the great work on Talking Joints Memo. I thought you did a great job with Shalene title at the High Lifestyle event yeah, uh, that was great. weeks ago. And I have that posted to, too. By the way, I'd love to see Shalene back in, in charge of this particular group, but I know that is never going to happen. She no, has done down. her thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I get it. For and sure. I, I got to say, this is one of those things where you kind of, you look at that that CCC and, you know, I don't know what the I forget how much they get paid, but I think it's almost beside the point. I don't know who's going to want to be uh, on it. But fortunately, there are there is some talent, you know, uh, you know, on there right now. And I think Commissioner Concepcion, certainly the one of the reasons they got through all the the muck uh, through all this was because she kind of took that up. I th of course, that leadership is being contested as part of the lawsuit. It all kind of, you know, that's the thing. When you write these articles, you, you don't want to keep people in the dark about any one dynamic. So I find myself on the fifth paragraph before I'm getting to like what's new sometimes. Cause it's like, right. you know, you have to know about the, you know, also the state auditor last week put out a report about the cannabis, about the cannabis control commission. That was pretty damning. Of course, the report was about stuff that happened in 2019, 2020. Uh, so, you know, there's just, there's so many moving parts and, uh, it's really hard. And a lot of the times you have these big mainstream pieces that kind of miss the point, but they have their point they want to make. Uh, but we go, you know, we go a little more granular. All right. Hey, Chris Farone from Talking Joints Memo. Thank you so much for joining us here on We Talk News. Yeah, this thanks week. for having me. And thank you to CNA Stores for supporting the efforts of people like Chris and myself. marketing these and yes i'm pitching to you that's steve levine the inventor and principal behind the one hit wonder and this little efficient device is getting rave reviews and there's more uses than just a one hit wonder the one hit wonder you get a 50 milligram hit so if you used a one hitter or dug out before you know the challenges steve's one hit wonder is easy to clean use and enjoy Standard one hitters do not work. We're afraid to inhale. The one hit wonder has a built in ash catcher. So inhale like it's your last breath. Suck the ash right through. Get it at onehitwonder.com.